Nationalism is a relatively recent phenomenon in world history. The rise of the modern nation-state began about 300 years ago. Since then, many emerging nations have claimed their independence, and Palestine is no exception. Uh, in 1988, the Palestine National Council met and adopted a historical resolution on behalf of the Palestinian people in which this council, which is our parliament in exile, uh, declared statehood by accepting the partition of Palestine. Uh, this referred directly to UN Resolution 181, which was adopted in 1947 uh, to partition historical Palestine into two states. By accepting that, we've accepted the sharing of Palestine and the existence of the State of Israel. The 1988 declaration of a sovereign Palestinian state gained little attention at the time. However, since then, over 100 other countries have formally recognized Palestine. More recently, Brazil and Argentina have weighed in with their recognition of Palestine within 1967 boundaries. Although the declaration achieved nothing in itself, it established a template for the acceptance of a sovereign Palestinian nation in the remaining portion of territory not claimed by Israel in 1948. It is this aspiration for Palestinian statehood that in September 2011, finally, came before the United Nations for a vote. Now, uh, we are talking about the 1967 boundaries, which are only 22% of what is left of historical Palestine, rather than 44% of historical Palestine. And uh, it is different because we are not unilaterally declaring statehood. We accepted the UN resolution in 1988, now we are saying this resolution has to be enacted because negotiations have not produced results. And we do need to have recognition of Palestinian statehood and we need to have membership in the UN. It helps to consider how, um, how to understand the entry into negotiations in 1991 in the first place. Because in 1991, after the Madrid conference, the beginning of negotiations was meant to be for Palestinians, a way of figuring out the details of arriving at a result that they thought was already predetermined. We know where the result is. That was the point of the Declaration of Independence. It was the point of recognizing UN resolutions uh, that implicitly at that time recognized Israel. And certainly after 1993, when the PLO explicitly offered full recognition of Israel, there was no question left anymore about the fact that the Palestinian uh, representative body rec recognizes the state of Israel. But the assumption was that negotiations would be about how to arrive at that already determined result. That's not what it turned out to be. And I think here we don't have to think of the parties, one of the parties as being honest or the other one being dishonest. That's not how we have to view it. We, they literally did not understand one another. Israel supports two-state solution, a Palestinian state, side by side to a Jewish state. Uh, this has been the policy for the last two decades. Prime Minister Netanyahu is the sixth prime minister in a row that supports a two-state solution. Uh, Palestinian state next to a Jewish state. Actually, two Israeli prime ministers, Ehud Barak in the year of 2000 and Ehud Olmert in the year of 2008, gave a very, very generous offers to the Palestinians that were rejected by the Palestinians. The language of two-state solution was adopted by the most hardline Israelis on the right. I mean, Netanyahu now talks about a two-state solution. Because talking about a Palestinian state in the abstract, leaves open the question of what that state would look like. Netanyahu, of course, supports a Palestinian state of his own making, of his own dreams, one that looks exactly like how he would like to see Palestinians. You know, cornered, or surrounded, no Jerusalem for them, all the settlements, at least the big settlements, stay. You can divide it into different parts so that you can really keep control over it. Israel gets to control the Jordan Valley. Of course he supports that. What Palestinians mean by a two-state solution is unambiguous. And that's the, you know, the Palestinian leadership has made many mistakes. And Palestinian political 
uh, yeah, Palestinian political organization and leadership has not often been very competent. But you cannot accuse it of being inconsistent. It has been clear, consistent, unwavering, never strayed from the very, a very clear answer of what constitutes an acceptable, the acceptable parameters of a Palestinian state for, for, for Palestinians. A Palestinian state could be reached only by direct negotiations. This is the only path, the only viable path, the only realistic path into peace, into a real peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. No other path will achieve that. The Israelis thought they were entering into negotiations in order to determine what it is that, how, the mechanisms of how they can give back what they feel comfortable giving back, as long as it does not go beyond what they consider to be their red lines. Palestinians thought they were entering into a negotiation simply about the means of arriving at a full withdrawal to the 1967 lines. That led to do two different understandings of what it is to negotiate. Well, actually, there is no such thing as bilateral negotiations because you have an asymmetry of power. You have the Israelis as the occupying power controlling everything and the Palestinians as people under occupation. And under bilateral negotiations, Israel used the logic of power and all the resources at its disposal, including its strategic alliance with the U.S., in order to carry out unilateral measures, such as building more settlements, building the walls, stealing more land, uh, confiscating ideas, expelling Palestinians, ethnic cleansing, transforming the whole character of Palestine, all these unilaterally. So the bilateral negotiations have been used to give Israel immunity, to act with impunity, and to act unilaterally, to prejudge the outcome of negotiations, and to dictate realities on the ground through the use of power, occupiers' power. Now, uh, in, in going to the UN, it is important because we are saying that the process of negotiations has produced nothing but more pain, a process for its own sake, buying time for Israel, exploited by Israel in order to create these facts. We need, first of all, curbing Israeli violations immediately, holding Israel accountable, which uh, the international community is responsible to do, and then ensuring that the Palestinian right to self-determination is not being undermined and that the two-state solution is not being destroyed by Israel. I find it very ironic that the Palestinians are going to the UN, uh, to the General Assembly, because in 1947, actually, the UN, the General Assembly, have decided on a partition resolution to divide Israel into a Jewish state and into an Arab state. And the fact of the matter is that the Palestinians, the Arabs, rejected this resolution. Often people talk about the 1947 uh, partition plan of the UN and how Palestinians did not accept it. It's hard to imagine how people living in a functioning, vibrant society can be made to imagine that they have to now carve up their society, not only their land, their lives. They have to carve up the relationships they have with other people to accommodate the establishment of another state in the midst of their country. It was an impossible idea for them to accept. Of course, we can think back now and say maybe they should have accepted it, it would have been better. There is no question that they would have fared better in history had they accepted it. But they would have had to be something not human to have done that, I think. Um, but after the destruction of Palestine in 1948, uh, the focus was how to rebuild oneself, how to rebuild one's society, how to regain one's right, and how to regain a shred of dignity. It took a long time for large segments of the Palestinian public to actually be able to take seriously the idea that maybe the answer to their, to, to, to the, to their, to their problem can lie in having a mini-state. That a mini-state, while it will not return their land fully, it will not return their rights, 
it will not give them justice. It will not give them what is due to them. Justice, injustice will remain done to them. They will remain the victims of oppression. They will remain people who have been dispossessed and dispersed. But that they might be able to find a way to live with a shred of dignity if there were to be a state in a small part of their country, 22% of their country. We asked students at Birzeit University near Ramallah what they thought about recognizing Palestine in the UN. أنا أرى أنه يجب على الأمم المتحدة إعتراف الدولة الفلسطينية لأنه عندما قامت طلبت الدولة الحكومة الفلسطينية الاعتراف بالدولة الفلسطينية افترضوا أو وجدوا لهم مجموعة من المتطلبات للوصول إلى الاعتراف بالدولة منها المؤسسات الأمنية والمؤسسات والوزارات وغيرها وعند الوصول إلى هذه الأفكار وقيام السلطة الوطنية مجهودة على شكورها على مجهودها أنه بتعزيز هذه المؤسسات وبنائها وتعزيزها من خلال المؤسسات الأمنية والوزارات وغيرها لجأنا إلى الأمم المتحدة للاعتراف بعد تحقيق المتطلبات التي عملت إسرائيل على إجهادها والقضاء عليها من خلال الجهود الدبلوماسية التي تقوم بها السلطة الوطنية الفلسطينية لأن إسرائيل عندما بدأت قيام دولتها قامت بنفس الطريقة The United Nations General Assembly, which helped to create the State of Israel, now elects her a member nation. Assembly President Ebert announces... ...formally declare Israel admitted to membership in the United Nations. Although Britain abstained from voting, congratulations are showered on Israel's Foreign Minister Moshe Sharet from all the delegates. The young republic, born of war, now joins the Council of Peace. The blue and white star of David is added to the flags of the 58 other member states. Uh, Israel declared statehood unilaterally in 1948, yes, based on 181. It was turned down first, it applied again, it was accepted conditionally, uh, provided it would implement UN Resolution 181 and 194, uh, referring to the return of Palestinian refugees. Uh, to us, uh, I mean, the UN has always been the source of international legitimacy, international law, but also the home of the international community. So we are going back to the UN in order to say we are a nation among nations. We want our rights to be recognized, to be protected, to be preserved, because obviously under occupation, Israel has been carrying out all sorts of prejudicial measures that are destroying the Palestinian state, destroying its viability. To go to the UN means that the territory that Israel is occupying is occupied territory, not disputed that Jerusalem is illegally annexed by Israel. It is uh, occupied territory. East Jerusalem is our capital. And we think that any resolution has to be based on international law. I believe that these things, that this is a distraction, that what matters is reality, and getting declarations from the UN changes nothing on the ground. And I think that um, it, it it ultimately is a gift to Israel by setting borders that, uh, in a sense, relinquish the rights of the rest of the Palestinians and the refugees. Of course, Israel is making a big fuss about it, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think the risk is that uh, it, you know, it's as if we're saying, well, we couldn't create a real Palestinian state, so let's pretend to have one. We'll just go to the UN and, and declare one anyway. Uh, and, and this is meaningless on the ground. So I, I'm very skeptical and I think it distracts from real efforts to change the power equation. Going to the UN is not a meaningless gesture. It is taking the Palestinian cause and placing it, placing it squarely uh, and firmly within international law and within the international community. We are saying this is not our creation. This is the creation again of the international community. We have the right to self-determination. We have to get the protection of the law, of international law, and Israel has to be held accountable. And of course, our territory has to be recognized as the 1967 boundaries, as occupied territory. Jerusalem has to be recognized as our capital. And so in a way, it is putting a limit to Israeli expansionism and to the Israeli discourse. 
that has shaped so far all the attempts at peacemaking, the, pe the endless peace process. So in a sense, no, it is not meaningless. It has symbolic value. It can be a gesture. It can tell people that the Palestinians, that you are not abandoned, you are not alone. But it has very concrete results. And it also enables us to reach the international community, all the agencies, all the organizations of the UN, which would enable us to hold Israel accountable to pursue it uh, judicially in terms of uh, legal accountability. This is extremely important to us because obviously Israel has not listened to anybody, including the requests by the sponsors of peace, including the quartet, including its own friends. Uh, and insists on creating these unilateral facts and destroying the chances of peace. It is time that the world decides that there has to be some sort of engagement and intervention to prevent Israel from thrusting the whole region into a whole new cycle of violence and extremism. Actually, if we are speaking about history, uh, it's worthwhile reminding people here that on December 15th, 1988, the Palestinians already went to the General Assembly and already got a resolution for a Palestinian state. 104 countries supported that. Only two voted against that, the United States and Israel, and nothing. The Palestinians did not receive state because of that, and that will clearly be the case in September if they go again to, this, to the uh, General Assembly uh, of the UN they should understand and the word should clarify to them that if they want a state and we want them to have a state, they should sit and negotiate directly with the Israelis. I am afraid that the, uh, the fact that they want to go to the uh, General Assembly of the UN will lead to more confrontations because people will see that they have not received anything in the day after. So I don't know the results of this uh, thing. It's basically a very interesting tactic decision that has um, you know, pros and cons. But uh, as, as an Israeli activist that is struggling together with Palestinians, it's really interesting to see how it corners all the propaganda machine of, uh, of the um, right-wing Israeli government uh, around the world to become uh, more and more pathetic. But not all critics of Israel agree with the current Palestinian bid for statehood. Embodied in their objection is a concept known as the one-state solution, a proposal in which the entire territory of historic Palestine would be united in a single, secular, democratic state with equal rights for Jews and Arabs alike. I prefer one state for all, one country for all. Quality, justice, for all. No borders, no two states, one state, one heart, can carry three children. But if we have one state, they will have to have civil rights, and then we have more Arabs and Jews. And this is the greatest fear of, of Jewish Israelis. Even the left, the most left, the majority, you know, to lose demographically. This is the, the, the fiercest fear. Usually what you hear in the Zionist left is separation. Separation, two-state solution, and everybody speaks about it very lightly and comfortably because they know it's impossible now. Israel made it impossible to have a Palestinian state. So everybody talks about two-state solution very, you know, they feel very liberal, but... Uh, I believe that, you know, in the end you will have one state with an Arab majority, Jewish minority, and uh, this is what this place is. But uh, the increase of number of settlers in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, the building of that horrendous, monstrous wall, the, 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 the subdivision and the fracturing of Palestinian territory, the physical fracturing of Palestine, uh, you know, you look at that, and you say, See, we're not, that's not going towards a state. If somebody looked at that and said, let me try to predict where the trend is, the trend is not towards anything that looks like a Palestinian state. So anybody in their right mind looking at what's going on on the ground will have to arrive at that conclusion. Is that irreversible? Is that inevitable? 
you know, nothing is inevitable as long as there is human will, if it is the product, if it is a human artifice. The wall is the product of human doing. The settlements are the product of human doing. What humans do, they can reverse. But it would take a, it would take a very concerted will on the part of Israelis to reverse this. And they seem to indicate nothing but the opposite will. The will not to make that possible. So, people who are sober-minded, very looking at the ground and seeing what's looking in front of them and saying, let me take my cue from what the world looks like on the ground, invariably conclude this is not leading to a state. This thing is not realizable. The people who support the one-state solution are really, I think, uh, people with uh, more uh, communist orientation or what is called the lunatic left in Israel. Uh, my opinion is that it's not up to me to decide. It's up to the Palestinians to decide what they want. There are other visions, as I said, people uh, often talk about a one-state solution and I don't want to criticize that vision because it is a beautiful vision. It is a vision in which you imagine the Israeli people and the Palestinian people from within themselves overcoming their past, overcoming their conflict and saying, we will live as equal citizens. What is unsaid in the articulation of that vision? We will erase our identity as we now understand it. We will be different people. We will no longer think of ourselves as Palestinians. We will become something else. We will no longer think of ourselves as Israelis. We will become something else. These things have happened in human history. But it's something that monumental you would have to await for the one-state solution to be something other than a beautiful and very admirable dream. In a world that resembles our own, that is structured by the territorial state, in which human beings organize themselves and identify themselves along national lines, the one-state solution is very difficult to imagine. So, sadly, we find ourselves between a beautiful but unrealizable vision in the world we know and a less beautiful and also unrealizable vision, but with a little bit more possibility of realizability. What would be the parameters of a sovereign Palestine? And how could it be successful if it did exist? Well, I think uh, what I'm striving for, what I've been striving for all my life, is to have an independent, sovereign Palestine that is genuinely democratic, that has a, a real system of good governance based on the rule of law, based on respect for its citizens' uh, rights and fundamental freedoms. And this state has to be pluralistic. It has to be inclusive. It has to be tolerant. It has to be a contemporary uh, civil state uh, that interacts with others on the basis of equality, with common uh, perceptions and values that are universal, like human rights and so on. So it is the state that we are struggling for. Of course, the boundaries are the 67 boundaries. We cannot afford to give away more land. We've already compromised to accept only 22% of historical Palestine. And Israel insists it wants to annex even more uh, of those boundaries, which means the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, which will be our capital, and of course the Gaza Strip. Uh, these would be our boundaries. And economically, the, I mean, no state However, large or small can exist in isolation. We have to exist within regional uh, frames of cooperation, of agreement, of mutual interest, and good neighborly relations. Because as the whole world is moving towards the multilateralism and regional agreements and cooperation, we uh, are creating states that are isolated, like Israel is, is really a garrison state. It is a state that builds walls around itself and between itself and the neighbors and so on. No, we need to tear down walls, we need to create uh, situations of mutual cooperation and respect and mutual benefit. One vision of a dynamic and prosperous Palestine comes from a small town on the California coast. The, uh, the ARC project began back in 2003 when two private donors uh, 
who were affiliated, associated with uh, Rand Corporation, a research institution here in Santa Monica, approached Rand separately with an interest in funding two studies about a prospective Palestinian state. Uh, the first study would look at the broader question of what would a Palestinian state, if one were created, need to succeed? And the second study was focused more on the, infra the physical infrastructure that a state would need, transportation, housing, and so forth. Um, one of the conclusions of the study was that if a Palestinian state uh, is going to succeed, Gaza and the West Bank would have to be a single territorial entity, which means that they would need a, some form of linkage. And a link has been part of every diplomatic agreement since uh, Oslo in the form of what are called safe passage roads. One of the main benefits is connecting the places where people live and work. That's a basic principle of cities around the world. For people to have jobs and to take care of their families, go to school, they need to be able to move uh, freely and easily between, uh, between cities. That's what the ARC infrastructure does. It allows uh, relatively rapid movement north to south between the major cities, but also with connections to very good bus service running east and west to smaller cities and the outskirts of the primary towns. Generally, our work as urban designers is focused on helping uh, people enjoy the maximum benefits they can from living in cities in different parts of the world. And the principles that we applied in Palestine, in a way, were no different than we applied to projects anywhere else in the world. We made a huge assumption that a peace accord uh, had been signed, that a new state had been formed, and then asked the question, what's the way to optimize the land, the cities, and the people, and the human resources? to create the best chances for success in that new state. So that's how we approach the problem, not, not politically, not with, a, with an agenda, but trying to problem solve with a, with a very, to be sure, an optimistic set of assumptions. But those, uh, there will have to be a peace accord if a new state is to come into existence and, and enjoy a, the possibility of success. And, and we hope that happens uh, very soon.